Welcome to our Lunch and Learn uh, for April. Uh, thank you for joining us on the first Friday as though it were a first Thursday. Uh, we appreciate the accommodation uh, in order to also secure the presentation services of our presenter that we'll introduce in a moment. Uh, but first we begin in prayer. And this is one of the two prayers that you'll find at the very end of the encyclical Laudato Si from 2015, written by Pope Francis. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. All powerful God, you are present in the whole universe and in the smallest of your creatures. You embrace with your tenderness all that exists. Pour out upon us the power of your love that we may protect life and beauty. Fill us with peace that we may live as brothers and sisters, harming no one. O God of the poor, help us to rescue the abandoned and forgotten of this earth, so precious in your eyes. Bring healing to our lives that we may protect the world and not prey on it, that we may sow beauty, not pollution and destruction. Touch the hearts of those who look only for gain at the expense of the poor and the earth. Teach us to discover the worth of each thing, to be filled with awe and contemplation, to recognize that we are profoundly united with every creature as we journey towards your infinite light. We thank you for being with us each day. Encourage us, we pray, in our struggle for justice, love, and peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Uh, one tiny housekeeping item, if you have not already uh, muted yourself, or if we have not already done so, we do ask you to do so. Our presenter this afternoon is Associate Professor and Chair of the Biology Department at St. Ambrose University, Dennis Teresi. Dennis teaches introductory biology courses for majors and non-majors, environmental science and upper level biology courses, with a specialty in community ecology and invasive species biology. The topic of today is caring for creation at the intersection of human health and the, hum human and the climate crisis. Additionally, there is a quote as to why Dennis wanted to study biology on the university website. It says, I have always loved nature and the outdoors and enjoy being outside whenever I can, hiking, biking, playing sports, just about anything. Although I began my undergraduate studies pre-med, I was quickly drawn to the study of how organisms interact with one another in the environment. It is as a result of all of his work and his passion that led us to pursue Dennis as a speaker for today. Without further ado, Professor Dennis Teresi. Thank you so much, Kent, and thank you everyone who could join today. Uh, I'm excited to be here and, and share some information with you uh, about some of the scientific backing uh, associated with climate change and how that interacts with some of our key concerns associated with Laudato Si, care for creation, and human health in general. Uh, I will direct your attention to the chat quickly uh, because uh, I wanted to share several different links for you uh, in case uh, all of the information gets dumped too quickly or you want to find information from much smarter people than me. Uh, so I've included my email address there for you. If you do have questions, by all means, feel free to reach out. Uh, I also have uploaded these slides as a PDF into a Google Drive folder. Uh, you're more than welcome to open, download, use as you would like. Uh, I'm more than happy to share this information as much as possible. Possible. And then you will see many different screen grabs across the uh, presentation. And many of those screen grabs have come from one of those two sources uh, that provide really fantastic weekly digests of some of the major changes going on in this space and in this sphere. Uh, they're distilled for uh, the public to read and um, synthesize. It's not necessarily something as a scientist that you have to know uh, exactly all of the details about parts per million measurements or other things like that. So if you are excited to learn more about this after the presentation, um, by all means, feel free to follow whichever of those links is most exciting to you. Without further ado, uh, we will jump into the presentation. Uh, so uh, as Kent mentioned, we will talk about caring for creation at the intersection of human health and the climate crisis. So six major focal points that we'll emphasize across the next 45 minutes or so. Um, we'll make sure everybody's on the same page with what we mean by those terms climate and climate change before we start considering 
how that's directly impacting human health now. Um, we'll think about the care for creation component with regards to living systems, the ecology and, and other considerations. Before we start to look at the intersection between those living systems and the human health, um, we'll think about infectious disease. Uh, I would be remiss from a care for creation perspective not to discuss some social justice initiatives and calls to action. Uh, and then I am an optimist uh, and climate discussions can often lead to climate grief and desensitization. So we will finish with solutions and optimism uh, so that we can feel empowered to go out and make the world a better place. So to make sure everybody's on the same page, uh, whenever we start thinking about climate change, um, we often consider climate in uh, terms of what we call a complex climate model. Uh, and I will apologize uh, quickly that uh, it, it looks like sharing the screen is um, uh, fuzzing out some of the text. Uh, so uh, if you wanna see every single word, you can, you can download that quick and follow along. But it was supposed to say complex climate models. So our climate is a very intricate dance of many different sorts of interactions, um, both living and non-living. Uh, at a very basic level, we have the sun, and the amount of direct sunlight a place gets dictates a lot about what goes on with our climate. Uh, of course, water is going to play a very important moderating role in a lot of those capacities, coastal areas versus inland areas, uh, the amount of rainfall, snowfall, all of those different sorts of components. But you can see with that global circulation model, there are many different factors at play that really define what we think of as what's going on in the environment. So climate being long-term patterns and trajectories uh, where we can average across 30 or even 100 years of data to really understand what does it mean to be in Davenport, Iowa, or the Diocese of Davenport, on April 5th. That changes year to year. Uh, it was 77 degrees here a couple years back, uh, but it was also snowing a couple days ago. So we'll take today as a nice median in that regard. So a lot of these different factors um, have very complex uncertainties and interplay associated with them. Um, but very important to recognize when we really start thinking about how organisms succeed on this planet. Uh, we often call planet Earth the Goldilocks planet. Many people know uh, our sister planet at one point in time, Venus, is incredibly too hot because its atmosphere is too thick. It traps too much heat uh, and it makes it very difficult for anything to persist. Um, by contrast, Mars, our other sister planet, has too thin of an atmosphere. So it gets incredibly cold on Mars. Um, Planet Earth is the Goldilocks planet. And one of the reasons for that is because of the greenhouse effect. So the greenhouse effect, if you've ever been in a greenhouse and recognized, you can walk in, light passes through our atmosphere without too much of an issue. Uh, it's a nice sunny day out my window right now. As that light, as uh, high energy radiation hits the Earth, it bounces back and the Earth also releases some of its own infrared radiation. So that radiation then, passes through the same part of the atmosphere, but much of it actually gets bounced back. Uh, so the greenhouse effect is these very trace gases in the atmosphere that are actually going to bounce back some of that heat. In other words, greenhouse gases, which are primarily carbon dioxide, CO2, methane, CH4, and nitrous oxides, NOxes, uh, those are these very, very minute particles that just bounce enough heat back to provide us this little blanket that keeps our nights a little bit warmer, so we don't have the dramatic differences that we often see uh, on Mars and other places like that. So the greenhouse effect, absolutely critical for maintaining life on Earth and maintaining consistent climate conditions. Very important to recognize though, when we think about those three greenhouse gases, across the recent history of planet Earth, we've seen pretty dramatic changes with regards to those greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere. So carbon dioxide is measured in parts per million. So we generally have had somewhere between 250 and 300 parts carbon dioxide for every million parts of air. This is a very, very small percentage. We're talking well below 0.1% of all of our air is made up of carbon dioxide. To take that a step further, methane, parts per billion, and nitrous oxides, also parts per billion. We're now talking less than 0.01% of our atmosphere is made up of these molecules. So less than 1% of what we think of as our atmosphere is these three molecules. Primarily what we breathe in are nitrogen and oxygen molecules. Um, and then these trace gases make up um, some part of that remaining 1%. So you can see pretty consistent levels of those measures. 
And then sometime around 1750 or 1800, we start to see this uptick in all three. So carbon dioxide levels have um, gone up about 70% or so. We're now actually over 400 parts per million of carbon dioxide. Um, Methane, you can actually see going from uh, levels at about 600, maybe 700 to almost 2000. So this is essentially tripled. Uh, and then nitrous oxides sitting at about 250 to 300 parts per billion, going up to about 300 parts per billion. So about a 30 or 40% increase in those. Okay, All three of those greenhouse gases have seen these dramatic increases uh, associated with human activity, the industrial age. Whenever you burn anything, you are going to convert carbon molecules into carbon dioxide because the burning process requires oxygen. So you fan the flames, you actually have oxygen combining with those solid, mostly sometimes liquid carbon components, and you form carbon dioxide. So all of the different activities that burn different materials end up leading to increased carbon dioxide release. Methane primarily is introduced through biotic processes. Um, so animals release methane both um, in burps and in farts. Uh, so you can see where we're going with this. A lot of our agricultural activities have led to increases in methane. And then nitrous oxide, uh, this is primarily associated with combustion engines. Uh, so this is a byproduct of the internal combustion process. Uh, so three different major activities that we've seen increased because of industrialization. And as a result, we have increased our greenhouse gas concentrations. Okay. Very important to recognize those are continuing to rise, and they are continuing to rise at a rate that really falls outside of the realm of any data that we have had uh, collected on Earth's historical records. So we have ice cores that go back about 800,000 years in places like uh, Siberia and Antarctica, where we can look at how carbon dioxide levels have corresponded to what's called a temperature proxy. So we can actually figure out um, a reasonable temperature of the atmosphere based on what sorts of variants of water and oxygen molecules were able to stay in the air if they were lighter or fall out if they were heavier based on the temperature. So scientists have successfully mapped uh, that both carbon dioxide and methane track very, very well with temperature proxies. Okay, uh, so you can sort of see if we go all the way back 800,000 years, goes up and then goes down and then goes up and down and up. Okay, same sorts of ideas. It's not a one for one track. Remember what we said on slide one? These are complex climate interactions. But at a very basic level, as these carbon dioxide and methane levels have gone up, so too have the temperature levels. Okay, if we look more recently, just across the last 20,000 years since we were in an ice age, you can actually start to see these temperature anomalies went up and then started to go down as they have in the past. And then approximately 300 years ago, we saw this quick upturn, uh, this enormous spike associated with the temperature anomalies from these ice cores. Okay, very important to recognize that we are essentially in an unprecedented stage, both with carbon dioxide levels and certainly with methane levels. Okay, um, The carbon dioxide levels, we've mapped back out to previous Earths as much as we can. Uh, the levels that we're at now, approximately 420 parts per million, uh, likely existed uh, whenever planet Earth was essentially uninhabitable and there were a ton of volcanoes. So we are living on a planet Earth that has more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere uh, than we know of uh, any life has. So very important to recognize. Um, many people see these sorts of figures and they say, well, the climate is always changing. And yes, in fact, because there are all of these complex interactions, El Nino and La Nina cycles, solar flares, volcanic eruptions, things like that, we do have pretty predictable ranges where the climate does vary across tens of years, hundreds of years, thousands of years, tens of thousands of years. Okay? But you can see with this spike and the absolute slope of these curves being much higher than anything that we've seen. Um, we're, we're starting to change the climate in ways that we've never really encountered before. If we go even more recently, you could really start to see how those average temperature anomalies across the planet uh, have changed uh, across the last 150 years or so. Okay, uh, So 
if you average out all of our climate across the last 150 years, you can see we had colder stretches. We had some in-between stretches where there were year-to-year -year variation, which is still consistent with uh, what we typically think of as climatology and atmospheric science. And then you can see all of the um, hottest years being most previously. Okay? Very important to recognize, and we're going to emphasize this several times across this discussion, um, is that the planet is not warming equally. There are different parts of the planet that are heating at different rates and in different sorts of ways. So you can see especially the Arctic and some mountain regions are actually increasing temperature much more than many of our oceans. I mentioned earlier that uh, our bodies of water are very, very effective at moderating temperature. And as a result, um, those haven't necessarily seen the same sorts of temperature increases as nearby continental masses because land heats up more quickly than water. So if we think even more recently and just focus in on some of these last few decades, uh, we've seen a lot of news articles about warmer and warmer and warmer temperatures. Okay, um, In 2023, uh, we had Earth's hottest day. So the average temperature across the entire planet uh, was broken on July 3rd. And then on July 4th, it happened again. Um, and then later on in July, it happened yet again. So we're seeing more of these record temperatures occurring, and especially whenever we think about, at a very basic level, climate change concerns, uh, hot temperatures really come to people's minds. For a long time, the framing was global warming. Um, and we now recognize that climate change is more than global warming, but it does start with that idea of global warming. So we're having average temperatures increase across the planet, but in some places more than others. And if we start to think not just about average temperatures, but about some of the extremes, we really start to see why people have begun framing it not as climate change, but as a climate crisis. Okay? So this is historical information about heat wave characteristics. These are prolonged periods of time where we've had temperatures over 90 degrees Fahrenheit. And you can see from 1961 to 2017, Places in the south had more heat waves than places in the north. Urban areas, and especially dense urban areas, had more heat waves than other locations. But perhaps more concerningly is, as you start to break it down decade by decade, we can see the number of heat waves increasing pretty clearly from one to two in the 1960s, where we would have those prolonged stretches, to six or more in many of these areas. And to think about it in a different way, not the number of heat waves, but how long those heat waves were lasting. You can see the average heat wave season length in major American cities looking in the 1960s to be about 20 to 25 days. So think about that quickly. The average American city was experiencing a heat wave for almost a month out of the year in the 1960s. Now that number is almost 70. Okay? And in some places, San Francisco, New Orleans, that number is over 80. In other words, almost three months out of the year are now meeting these heat wave requirements. To start to think about how some of these changes associated with greenhouse gases uh, are occurring, we can really start to see if we continue seeing increases as we have so far with greenhouse gas emissions, that blanket's going to continue getting warmer. So these sorts of trends are going to continue. And in some instances, some of the most extreme examples, we might actually see that increasing even more. So this is specific to Chicago. We're getting pretty close to home now. Okay? Um, the average number of days over 100 degrees Fahrenheit in Chicago, 1976 to 2005, that number was 1.4. Okay? 2016 to 2045, this is projected under different sorts of future scenarios, which we'll talk about later. Uh, we're looking at something like five. Okay. Continuing on into the future, you can see that those numbers are going to increase. And depending on which future we choose, um, those numbers might increase in different sorts of ways. Now, some of you may remember, Chicago has already dealt with heat waves. And especially whenever we start thinking about human health and direct impacts on human health, heat waves are actually the number one killer of humans related to natural disasters. So lots of people think about derechos, hurricanes, floods, blizzards, other components like that. But in fact, extreme heat kills more humans than all other weather-related impacts besides hurricanes combined. So tornadoes, derechos, blizzards, uh, wildfires, 
uh, they still don't add up to extreme heat. And Chicago had one of the best examples of these sorts of concerns. 1995, late July, early August, there was forecasted a heat wave coming on. Uh, the mayor said, this is just what happens in the summer. Uh, the director of human services for uh, Chicago said, anybody who puts themselves in harm's way is just neglecting their own health. Five days later, their uh, hospitals were overwhelmed. Over 700 people died. To put that into context, Superstorm Sandy and Hurricane Harvey combined to kill 200 people. The Chicago heat wave across five days killed almost more than three times uh, those two major events combined. And it's important to recognize whenever we think about these sorts of heat waves and the impacts that they can have on different populations, taking care of oneself in a hurricane often means following directions, evacuating, getting to somewhere safe inland, and then going back home two, three days later, maybe a couple weeks later. When heat waves hit, it hits the entire region. It hits everyone. And especially those who may not have somewhere to go or may not have the agency to decide where to go, it can end up complicating pre-existing conditions. We can have a lot of acute impacts on chronic circumstances. So very important to recognize when we start thinking about human health, uh, there's a very direct connection between the increasing greenhouse gases, the increasing temperatures, and as a result, increasing heat stress, heat exhaustion, and heat stroke that can overwhelm hospitals and other things like that. It is very important to recognize at this stage of uh, human history, we really are in unprecedented territory from a scientific perspective. It doesn't really matter what sort of metric you choose, we're going to break a record. Okay? So 2023, you can see when we're thinking about melting sea ice, when you think about average oceanic temperature, when you think about average world temperature. When you think about wildfires, many people will remember the late June and July air quality here in the Quad Cities was unsafe for people to go out because thousands of miles away, uh, there was more going on um, with regards to fires than had ever occurred before. Uh, so we are breaking records. And it's very important to recognize um, this is one of those sorts of slides where people can look at this and, and there's a lot of climate grief. And yes, there are going to be a lot of future concerns and challenges, uh, but this does also mean that there are opportunities. Um, and we will talk about some of that a little bit later. Before that, I wanna make sure everybody's on the same page with these terms, global warming and climate change. Pretty much everything that we've talked about so far has really emphasized as we've increased greenhouse gas concentrations, we are trapping more heat inside our atmosphere than we have before. And as a result, the average atmospheric temperature has gone up. This is what people have talked about with regards to global warming for a pretty long period of time. But in reality, that's just the root of what we're seeing from an atmospheric perspective. And climate change, on the other hand, really emphasizes that there's a lot more that goes into our atmosphere than just temperature. Remember all of those ideas that we discussed on the very first slide, thinking about water, thinking about wind, thinking about air pressure. And all of those can contribute to different sorts of outcomes related to our climate. So climate change is a much broader sort of concept that recognizes because we are changing these temperatures, we may end up changing additional outcomes associated with atmospheric principles. And at a very basic level, a lot of that has to do with increased unpredictability. If we're in record-breaking range, we don't necessarily have historical precedent for what's going to happen next. Uh, and that makes it difficult to forecast and to know exactly what's going to happen. Okay? So at a very basic level, to make sure everybody's on the same page, the heating of the atmosphere does have manifest impacts on all of these, especially because hot air behaves differently from cold air. To think about that in scientific terms, we can think about the jet stream. So this is the movement of air masses around the world as it spins. So most people hopefully recognize the primary source of our weather is from west of here. If something's happening in Des Moines right now, it's probably gonna be in the Quad Cities in the next couple of hours, okay? That's the jet stream. We have air masses that move. And as you have warm fronts and cold fronts, they interact and move in different sorts of ways. Many people um, often recognize that um, cold fronts are often going to lead to wind. They're going to lead to uh, very dry conditions. People get chapped and things like that. Whereas warm fronts, that hot air can actually hold more materials in it. It can hold more water so we have hot and humid summers and other components like that. Just as importantly, 
warm fronts are generally more stable. So as a result, if we have more warm air, that warm air persists, it stagnates, it stays in locations for longer periods of time, and it can actually cause the jet stream to start to loop. So instead of the jet stream moving air on in a pretty reasonable sort of fashion, it can actually have a lot of that air stagnating. Now, many of you have probably heard of areas in the United States experiencing their first ever heat domes. This is a great example. We saw um, some in Oregon previously. Um, California really got hit by one um, just a few uh, months ago, where essentially the exact same air stagnates for a very, very long period of time. But just as importantly, because that jet stream is looping, we're now also seeing it picking up water from places that it wouldn't have before and dumping that water in new places. So more recently, just a couple uh, months ago, uh, the West Coast got hit by this atmospheric river where the jet stream was now flowing essentially parallel to the Sierra Nevada mountains. And all of that water got trapped. Instead of traveling across the United States, it essentially all stayed on the West Coast. We had flooding in December, closing school in Southern California. Okay? It's also important to recognize that if this is happening with persistent hot air, if that hot air is causing the jet stream to loop, the looping jet stream is going to have impacts on cold air as well. So cold air might be more windy, but it also can end up stagnating. It can't push the hot air out as much because whenever those cold fronts and warm fronts interact, the more persistent hot air often will win out. So even when we have cold winter conditions, we sometimes have those conditions stagnating for longer periods of time than they have in the past. So you can start to see this isn't just global warming. Because these changes in the atmosphere are happening, we're now starting to encounter new winter phenomena, new extreme events that aren't necessarily tied directly to how hot the air is, but how the air masses are moving and interacting around the atmosphere. We have a great example of that just from this past January. I told you we were breaking records all over the place. Um, many of you probably saw this National Weather Service infographic uh, that we had the snowiest week on record. 25.5 inches of snow recorded here in Moline, Illinois. And Dubuque actually also broke it as well. Um, so as we have warmer air masses, remember they can hold more water. So if they're slowing down and they get cold, there's more water to be dropped. And instead of that air mass moving on to Chicago or to Indianapolis or other things like that, it's moving slower. So as a result, it can end up dropping more of that precipitation in one particular location. Fun fact, the Quad Cities in Dubuque were some of the only places in Iowa that actually broke that record. Waterloo also did, but Des Moines didn't. Um, just showing where those real regional bands of this persistent precipitation can occur. We can take that a step further and think about places that don't get snow very often. And now we have blizzard warnings happening in Los Angeles and Portland, Oregon. Again, because they're encountering weather events that they haven't necessarily uh, had occur in the past. Okay? So whenever we think about precipitation, this is really where we're start starting to think about climate change beyond global warming. You can see general increases in seasonal precipitation patterns. Probably should go without saying after this week that we've had uh, that we're getting more uh, heavy precipitation events. And that's especially important in the winter and spring. But you can also see a very important consideration that just as we said there are variations in climate change considerations across the um, planet, there are also variations across seasons. So our winters and springs are getting wetter and our summers and falls, at least here in the Midwest, are actually getting a little bit drier. And one of the major reasons for that is many of these uh, winter and spring events are dumping more precipitation in smaller periods. So instead of getting one or two rains every week across the spring, we're now getting four straight days of rain that followed two and a half weeks without any rain. So we're going longer stretches without precipitation, and then we're getting more precipitation dumped in a shorter period of time. So we're getting greater percentage of our precipitation falling in those heaviest events. 
And that leads to some real important challenges whenever we start thinking about how to plan for human health in the future uh, with regards to care for creation. So Hurricane Harvey was a great example of this. Uh, we had a storm front come off the Gulf of Mexico into Houston, Galveston area 2017, uh, and it essentially stagnated for three weeks. Multiple feet of rain falling for three weeks in one location uh, there really isn't any human infrastructure that could really try to use all of that. They closed all the highways and basically let all of the water run down the interstate freeways uh, because there was nowhere else for that water to go. More locally, of course, we had the Western Iowa floods in 2019, uh, where uh, the Missouri River was out of its banks for nine straight months. From early March until November, uh, we had... Uh, over flood zone uh, of the Missouri River. And that had drastic impacts on agriculture and other considerations. To think about additional examples, um, you can really start to see how many of our storm fronts have started to develop. Many of them are very slow moving and very long because we have that looping jet stream. You can see in this example, instead of having this come from um, Nebraska into Iowa into Illinois, uh, it's really coming up from those warmer areas where it's carrying more warm uh, water vapor and then cooling off and essentially stagnating. Um, so we've had places that have had seven straight days of uh, more than one inch of snowfall um, for more periods of time recently than we ever have before. So these sorts of pre precipitation challenges are really important to recognize because they're offset by lack of water throughout much of the rest of the year. Many people in Iowa are familiar with our long drought seasons. If we've got heat waves, we often don't end up having significant convective thunderstorms to cool things off. So as a result, uh, we're seeing more drought conditions and we're seeing more challenges with watering crops, making sure that people have access to water. If we start to map some of that out long-term, uh, you can see the agricultural breadbasket is going to face a lot of real challenges. Many people are familiar with some of the concerns in the Southwest United States. We always say California is the climate change example, uh, but uh, there are going to be some additional challenges elsewhere. So we've got heavy precipitation events, we've got drought, and this has led to a new phenomenon that was coined by the National Weather Service in 2022, which we call weather whiplash. So we don't have enough water and then we have too much water. Um, to think about it a different way, they formally coined flash drought in 2023. Not flash floods, which have existed for a long time, but flash drought, where you're not necessarily expecting not to have water. And we've seen some of these impacts of drought more locally. Many of you will remember the major dust storm that hit Illinois just last year and basically blocked out vision on the interstate. Multi-car crash, uh, seven people died, 37 people hospitalized, uh, and that was just last year. Um, so a prolonged event of dry, warm weather in early April, dried the topsoil down to eight inches, and then the bottom layer retained moisture and the strong winds made the top layer airborne. Very, very clear example of how climate change is interacting with all of the other factors that exist in the environment, but can end up exacerbating some of those major concerns. So we've seen with tons of different hurricanes, hurricanes have happened well before the idea of climate change really um, developed, but those hurricanes are stagnating. They're dropping more water, they're causing more storm surge. And because they are lasting longer, they're more likely to go back to back. And we're having additional concerns associated with some of these challenges of prolonged hurricane seasons and uh, more days during the hurricane season where people are on hurricane watch. Uh, so very important, significant considerations associated with some of the climate change challenges. More locally, uh, we all got introduced to a term that's actually been around uh, since the late 1800s. Uh, for those who don't know, great little Quad Cities nugget, Gustavus Heinrichs, who coined this term in the late 1800s, uh, actually lived in Davenport for a time and then worked at the University of Iowa. He was the first to explain the phenomenon derecho. So we had that major August derecho, of course. It's the most expensive natural disaster in history because it knocked over a bunch of really happy corn that we then couldn't harvest because it was too late to plant and they got destroyed. Uh, and then we started having derechos in December. And then, we started having tornadoes in December. All of this is unprecedented and somewhat unpredictable sorts of threat multipliers. All of these events have happened before, but they're happening with more frequency and they're happening in ways that we haven't necessarily anticipated before. 
lots of different challenges that make it a little bit more complicated to really try to plan and prepare accordingly. It is important to recognize even in the United States, the impacts of climate change are going to vary pretty dramatically by region. Um, and when we think about natural disasters, uh, we often frame them in terms of human impacts. Uh, so a natural disaster uh, that doesn't cause a lot of environmental damage to a bunch of agricultural crops may not get the same billing. And certainly whenever we start thinking about human death tolls and other considerations like that, uh, there are lots of natural disasters that don't necessarily meet that level. But it doesn't really matter how you scale or consider natural disasters. The reality is with climate change, we're having considerations where those rising temperatures are leading to new atmospheric behaviors that are setting records, again, not necessarily in ways that we want to. So whenever we see uh, billion dollar disaster events, and yes, this is inflation adjusted. So we are fairly comparing 2021 percentage of GDP versus 1980 percentage of GDP. You can really see how some of those natural disasters have developed. And in, in particular, if we look just at 2020, 2021, we see a lot more of those severe storms. We're having more heavy precipitation events that are leading to additional significant concerns. Tropical cyclones, similar sort of idea. Uh, hitting some of our Pacific islands. So very important to recognize everything that I've said so far has actually been known by a lot of people for a long time. Uh, so in 1965, the United States government commissioned a report of the Environmental Pollution Panel as part of the President's Science Advisory Committee that talked specifically about atmospheric carbon dioxide and the possible effects of increased atmospheric carbon dioxide on climate, including some of the things that we've already talked about. To take it a step further, some of the major climate um, related corporations have recognized this internally. Um, there have been leaked uh, documents and white papers uh, from as early as 1982, where those organizations recognized that the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere was very clearly going to connect to some of these challenges. And to take it a step further, everything that I've said so far isn't actually political. Lots of some of the most conservative organizations on the planet, the military being a great example, are planning for a true future climate. Uh, so really trying to understand how are they going to respond to all of these new severe storms, these droughts, these challenges, these other concerns. And some of those big fossil fuel emitters are also recognizing, you know what, we can't keep doing this forever. And part of that's economics because we're running out a lot of those fossil fuels. But part of it is also messaging and making sure that they are part of the uh, solution and not just part of the problem. So, that is a quick overview that took a half an hour, sorry, Kent, uh, of the ideas of climate change. Uh, so we can then spend a little bit of time considering how we think about climate change with regards directly on human health considerations. So extreme heat, we've already touched on just a little bit. Of course, extreme weather is going to have um, fatalities and concerns with that as well. I can't go into all of these details, but I will uh, try to cover many of them uh, in capacity uh, as I can. So these are very much direct impacts. It is important to recognize as well, climate change is going to cause a lot of indirect impacts on infrastructure and society. Uh, so our electricity grid being an excellent example, but also our hospital infrastructure and flooding. Many of you may remember Hurricane Maria with nursing home capacity and their accessibility to energy whenever everything was flooded in Miami. So when we think about direct impacts on human health, there are a few key examples uh, that are relevant to mention as people start to plan for the future. One of those is air pollutants. Remember, hot air can hold more things than cold air. And one of those things is ozone. Now, many of you are probably familiar, ozone, which is normally existing in the atmosphere. It is not a greenhouse gas, but it is functioning to protect our health. Uh, it's basically going to prevent UV radiation from hitting Earth's surface. It's very reactive which is why it neutralizes that UV radiation. But as we have um, more cars and we have more industrial activity near the surface, some of this ozone is now settling onto the Earth's surface and people are breathing it in. And when they breathe it in, uh, they are actually uh, at risk of having that reactive molecule basically neutralizing their lung function, which doesn't sound very good. Uh, so as a result, we're seeing increase in ground level ozone. We're seeing additional impacts. If we look locally, uh, there are some forecasts that say 500 additional deaths per year in the, the Midwest because of ground level ozone, people breathing in unhealthy air. That unhealthy air isn't just ozone. This should say, uh, allergens and allergies. Uh, so 
uh, I think the, the screen sharing is uh, just a little bit grumpy. So uh, we will uh, push through as much as we can. So allergens, anything that causes the immune system to think it's under attack, but the immune system isn't actually. Uh, so we have lots of pollens as we've had plants actually at a very basic level, minimally benefit from increased carbon dioxide, increased photosynthetic activity and longer growing seasons. We have more pollens and we have more of those challenges that may lead to atopic dermatitis, eczema flare-ups, other components like that. Uh, you couple that with warmer temperatures where people are often a little bit more sensitive and you can have more reactions. Same sort of idea as we think about asthma and COPD. Uh, if we're not having fully functioning airways and now we're breathing in more stuff that may trigger a reaction, that can lead to additional challenges associated with that. Whenever we think about other non-infectious diseases, one of the common evaluations is uh, environmental impacts associated with cancers. So for those who don't know, cancers are your own cells that then become mutated for some reason or another, and then they start growing out of control. They consume resources from your body and they prevent your body from carrying out those functions. There are thousands of different types of cancers, but many of them do have very, very clear climate change connections. Um, so some of them may seem a little bit tenuous, but everything up there is actually scientifically justified and backed research. So as we see changes, especially in air pollution concerns and nutrition concerns associated with food waste and challenges with that, we end up seeing more people having uh, long-term effects associated with cancers. Uh, there's been a very good study associated with Flint, Michigan, exposure to lead and some of the developmental and cancer concerns associated with that. Uh, that's a very clear non-climate change connection, uh, but it is uh, a good example of some of these concerns challenges. In the interest of time, uh, we will uh, gloss over quickly additional water pollution concerns, which of course in uh, the Midwest, we have agricultural considerations associated with uh, fertilizer use, 50% runs off, which leads to changes in water bodies, dead zones, other concerns like that. Harmful algal blooms can actually lead to many different people getting sick um, because those algae love living inside warm, wet places, which our bodies are very similar to. And then we do have challenges associated with saltwater intrusion as well. If we have more drought, uh, especially our freshwater sources, we may run into additional issues where uh, sea level conditions are getting into places that they shouldn't. This is also an important challenge in a lot of developing nations where we may not have separated stormwater and sewage treatment facilities. So those heavy precipitation events can actually lead to a lot of stormwater mixing with sewage water, which can then get into water bodies. And this does happen in developed nations as well, um, but you can see contaminated water, the second highest cause of child mortality around the world. It is very important to recognize, and I'll mention this again, climate change isn't the only challenge associated with all of these human health concerns. There are many additional uh, pre-existing conditions, lifestyle, diet, environmental impacts that in many circumstances may actually contribute more to those problems than climate change. But again, climate change is one threat multiplier that destabilizes any sort of equilibrium that might be occurring. If somebody is struggling with renal failure and then suddenly their power gets knocked out by a hurricane, that can lead to additional challenges for them to continue to have dialysis. Uh, so those sorts of acute on chronic impacts can lead to really big complications. So uh, we'll move on to some of the interactions between care for creation and human health. When we think about living systems, um, we can really break it down into plants and animals because that's what most people care about. So when we think about plants, especially from an agricultural perspective, we often focus on phenology. If it's warmer on average throughout the year, we actually are gonna have a longer growing season. So we're gonna have plants growing in more places and growing successfully for longer periods of time. So you can see that increase in growing season day length. Uh, the Southeast United States is probably the exception in the US because they have lots of citrus things that they plant in winter. And if they get late frosts, they're actually going to lose some of their growing season, which is a big challenge. Okay. Um, but at a very basic level, we're seeing organisms move up. So whether that is in latitude, so moving north, here's the example with sugar maples, or uh, altitude, so moving up on montane habitats and environments, uh, we're seeing them shift in that sort of direction. It doesn't really matter whether you're looking at plants or animals, we are seeing those sorts of shifts from current distributions to future distributions that are moving north. Now, important to recognize here with the animals, Northern cardinals are pretty generalized. They can succeed in a lot of environments, which is why we see them throughout the winter pretty consistently. Um, they're 
going to do pretty well in future scenarios. American Robins, maybe not so much. And that's a pretty consistent through line. When you have specialists that have very unique sorts of environmental conditions where they can succeed, they may be most at risk. So our coral reefs are an excellent example, very biodiverse and very valuable to humans. Um, so bioprospecting is how we've actually found a lot of our pharmaceutical drug treatments uh, by essentially isolating chemicals from different sorts of organisms, things we wouldn't have ever synthesized on our own, but we can mimic and we can end up using them in a lot of different capacities. But just as importantly, from an economic perspective, uh, these sorts of specialized areas can end up performing a lot of valuable what we call ecosystem services. So human economic benefits for nutrient cycling, pollution filtering, um, temperature mediation, uh, water regulation, uh, those are all incredibly valuable. And we may end up losing those depending on how those different ranges shift. It is important to recognize lots of people think from a climate change perspective and they're like, oh no, everything's gonna die. That's not true. We will still have plants and animals on planet earth and many of them may actually benefit um, one of the major challenges that we may encounter in the future with regards to an ecological perspective is the process that we call biotic homogenization. So think back quickly to this. If we no longer have robins, the cardinals are going to have more resources to take advantage of. We're going to have more cardinals throughout the United States. So it's going to be a more homogeneous landscape with regards to what sorts of organisms exist there. And if you think about all of these different organisms that already have scientific demonstration benefits associated with climate change considerations, many of them have some very clear connections. One of those connections being they generally benefit from human made habitats and interacting with human systems and the other that they can succeed in a lot of different environments. So we have invasive species that are likely to increase throughout the world. And you can see on that map how closely that tracks with human development. So the United States, India, China, Western Europe, those are the places where we're going to have lots of invasive species because we have lots of human altered habitat. And as we alter that habitat and then introduce climate change, we're essentially changing the rules for what sorts of organisms can exist there. Organisms will exist there, but they may not be the ones that are necessarily unique, that are necessarily distinctive, that are necessarily carrying out specific roles. So as a result, we have this sort of interaction between protecting biodiversity in order to prevent invasive species and mitigate some of those impacts of climate change. So then we can do the deep dive that's going to take about four and a half minutes of interactions between these living systems and human health. So many of our infectious disease components track with different living system concerns. Um, so both viruses and bacteria, viruses technically not alive, bacteria, living systems that can exist on their own without a host, uh, do benefit from hosts. So infectious disease can be epidemics, which we've had regional outbreaks, or pandemics, of course, COVID being a great example all over the planet. And the real interaction often comes from this uh, introduction of vectors. So vectors are organisms that carry disease but aren't necessarily harmed by it. And we can have different models of different sorts of diseases where humans can get each other sick, which of course happens with COVID, but they can also get each other sick indirectly through that vector. So here in the Midwest, Lyme disease, West Nile virus, uh, across the planet, uh, swine flu, mad cow disease, uh, malaria, they all have an animal component to it. So everything that I just said about animal ranges still applies to all of those infectious diseases. So malaria is likely to be in the United States uh, on a consistent basis moving into the near future because there are more environments where mosquitoes can succeed for a longer stretch of the year. Um, and just as importantly, when we start thinking about human health considerations, uh, many of these diseases, as they start to move into new regions where people haven't been exposed to them before, they actually lead to higher mortality rates. Our immune systems are not evolved to respond to malaria. People who have many, many generations of exposure to malaria have some sort of immunability that's been built up in many instances because their ancestors were able to survive and other potential ancestors may have died out and as a result didn't reproduce. Okay. So we're seeing a lot of tropical diseases increasing in abundance. Dengue fever has had a pretty significant outbreak in the Southwest United States. Lots of different viruses. Many of you will remember the Ebola outbreak, SARS, MERS, H1N1, uh, of course, HIV AIDS ongoing. 
um, Ebola, a very clear sub-Saharan uh, disease uh, that had very clear animal connections associated with it. And then Zika in 2016, uh, which certainly spiked to a greater level because of concerns associated with its El Nino cycle. Now, again, important to recognize climate change is not the only factor that is leading to these sorts of diseases increasing. We have more people living in high density areas that are hotter than their surroundings. So the urban heat island is a very important concern, but we're also spreading those diseases much faster than we ever have before. And then lastly, we have something called the human wildland interface, which is a great interaction between some of these living system concerns and human health. So Ebola is a great example. Uh, many of you know bushmeat was one of the primary ways that it was introduced into the human population. And then people got each other sick directly from bleeding out of orifices and other things like that. Well, it's important to recognize as we've started to modify those wild areas, as people are poaching more, as people are cutting down forests for agriculture more, we end up seeing additional challenges associated with exposure to those wildlife diseases. Many of you probably know that COVID likely spilled over from bat populations in a wildlife market in China because those bats could be sold. And we also have some very interesting climate signals associated with lots of these infectious diseases. COVID wasn't a tropical disease, so in fact, in a lot of our sort of temperate areas where we had seasonal outbreaks, people would go inside and breathe on each other at uh, concentrated periods of the year, uh, we ended up seeing greater spikes than some of our more tropical environments. It's important to recognize that infectious disease can also impact climate change. If people are prioritizing um, COVID or treatment of cholera or other concerns like that, we may end up slowing down some of our uh, climate change initiatives and strategies. It is important to recognize, though, um, COVID was a, a massive outbreak. It obviously changed a lot of our lifestyle. But from a UN global health perspective, uh, COVID probably pales in comparison to what's likely to come next. So we've had flu and the influenza virus uh, in society for hundreds, if not thousands of years. Um, but that flu virus really represents more than 600 separate strains. And that leads to one of the challenges. There are so many different hosts, so many different reservoirs where we can have spillover events. So avian flu, um, the swine flu outbreak, H1N1 uh, in 2009, 2010, an additional example where we can end up getting a lot of evolution of these diseases into new environments pretty quickly. And in fact, uh, this is just from last week, uh, the American Veterinary Medical Association is very concerned about a new avian influenza outbreak that is now in, in cattle. It isn't necessarily into humans yet, but it is starting to get there. And when we have all of these zoonotic diseases that are tracking migratory bird pathways, that are tracking where livestock are held and agricultural systems are occurring, we can end up having very, very significant concerns. Bill Gates in 2018 said, um, up to 300 million people dead in the course of nine months. For comparison, we're at about 10 million people um, confirmed dead from COVID in four years. Um, so this is orders of magnitude much worse um, because we sort of have that underlying uh, existence, but we don't necessarily have um, immune defenses built up against it. So very important to recognize as humans continue to modify the planet in ways beyond climate change, we might end up increasing our risk associated with infectious disease. Okay. Now is where we start to turn the corner a little bit. Not all hope is lost. There are countless examples of infectious diseases that have declined over time. And everything that is up there is up there because human innovation has led to developments in some sort of medical treatment, whether that's preventative like vaccines or um, reactive, uh, where we can have appropriate sorts of antibiotics or antiviral drugs that can help individuals recover. Almost all of those have been eradicated. Um, there were two cases in po of polio in Afghanistan and Pakistan uh, last year, but we're getting close. Okay? So important to recognize everything that we've talked about so far really emphasizes that not everyone is going to encounter climate change or climate change in human health in the same sort of way. To think about that from a social justice perspective, it's really important to recognize the people responsible for many of these challenges aren't going to be the ones who are dealing with those impacts. 
Um, so the global south is a term that often gets uh, lumped together for those who aren't really contributing to the problem, but are dealing with the brunt of it. And this is a great example of what we call externalities or external costs. The decisions we're making in the United States are impacting other people and they're paying those costs, but we aren't necessarily. This is also an example of an environmental economics idea called the tragedy of the commons. Um, the atmosphere is a shared resource. Anybody can do whatever they want with it. Uh, I can go burn a campfire right now and um, spew my um, smoke out into something that someone else is going to breathe. Um, but if everyone asks, acts in that sort of self-interest, we can end up harming global populations. So very important to recognize whenever we think about some of these challenges associated with climate justice, it's not just what's happening there. It's also what sorts of resources they have to support themselves. Okay? So many different sorts of vulnerable populations. Um, so children, the elderly, minority populations, especially in democratic societies uh, where decisions may be made in the best interest of the majority, just as an example. Um, and for full disclosure, uh, I am very much in favor of democracy, but its structure does lead to additional challenges and concerns associated with how we make sure every single member of society is going to be protected and not just those who are going to reelect me to office. Uh, so children, of course, um, a lot of different major challenges associated with their exposures, their agency, and some of their major challenges of um, immune defense and development. We can also see similar concerns associated with Zika virus and pregnant women, outdoor workers, of course, who are exposed to many different air pollution concerns, heat waves, and other challenges like that. Um, so there are many different strategies that we'll see uh, on the last few slides associated with trying to address equity. Um, so justice really emphasizes giving everyone a chance to be successful, not necessarily giving everyone the same resources. And the only way that can happen is really through governmental regulation and cooperation. Um, but if that does happen, if we really do focus on justice, we do get a best case scenario for all. Um, and it's really important to recognize particularly from a climate perspective, there's this idea of climate determinism, which we sometimes call climate imperialism. Americans don't necessarily have all the right answers. And in fact, if people go into addressing climate justice concerns with that sort of mindset, we can miss strategies that have worked in some of these other nations for a very, very long time. So there are a lot of solutions out there. Like I said, uh, lots of sad stuff, but also we have three minutes worth of good stuff too. Um, so many different examples of successful action already. The Paris Climate Accords, uh, when President Biden was elected his very first day, he took many different actions um, to address climate concerns. Um, and we've also seen a lot of people starting to value climate change policy. I would be remiss not to uh, congratulate Pope Francis, who has truly been a world leader on a lot of these different issues, not just climate change, of, of course, um, but that is leading to dioceses, universities, other Catholic leaders actually taking action that they wouldn't have 10 years ago if he had not published Laudato Si. But I also want to emphasize a lot of the action doesn't have to happen from world leaders. There was a 15 year old girl who didn't like where the world was going. So she stopped going to school because she didn't wanna live in the future that her school was training her for. Greta Thunberg has since won a Nobel Peace Prize and become incredibly famous for her global climate strikes. Uh, and she's getting the attention of activists the world over. Uh, there are many different sorts of activities that people can take. I will leave everyone with uh, this sort of idea that a lot of the dire warnings and the scientific information that is out there really do work. Uh, so this is an example from 1898, uh, where the president of the British Academy of Sciences said, humans may be dying of hunger sometime in the next 40 years. And it prompted people to take action to change what would have occurred if they hadn't. And we're seeing a lot of that in a global sphere right now. Lots of different concerns associated with the future and calling it a climate crisis so that people start to take action. I will tell you, unfortunately, th those calls to action haven't been enough yet. We still are on track for a warming climate and increased impacts associated with what I talked about. But there are a lot of economic incentives that have actually led to pretty significant changes in behaviors just across the last 10 years. 
And perhaps what's most fascinating is that there are many different economic levers that can be pulled in many different ways that really will help society address many of these different sorts of challenges. There are innovations that are happening literally every single week to try to address this intersection between making sure humans have a habitable planet and making sure that we can continue to have a functional society. It really is a win-win where people are starting to make money off of addressing some of these climate change concerns. Now, some of these ideas are way out there. So solar geoengineering or cloud seeding, some of you may have heard of. If you want to see the dystopian view, uh, go watch Snowpiercer, the movie, uh, which is where it goes too far. Uh, but it could potentially completely flip the script related to what our climate risks would be. Um, so there are strategies out there, but we really need to lean into science-backed strategies to make sure that we're not just trying something, but in fact, trying something that is going to work. Very important to recognize when we're thinking about this from a global care for creation perspective, those who have social support end up doing better in the long term. It's not necessarily throwing money, it's building community. So events like this are excellent because you get to know people who are interested and uh, capable of building that sort of community. And the reality is we have to try. If we don't try, the evidence is very clear. We are going to have excess mortality in the millions, potentially in the hundreds of millions every single year related to these climate change events. Right? And in fact, most Americans are on board with this. This is something that people see from an economic perspective, from a human health perspective, but also from a getting to live your life perspective. So if we really do want to succeed at the game of life, we have to recognize that we have to value that one resource that's really providing a lot of those resources that we want. So I will end there. I do have, of course, as a St. Ambrose rep, an Ambrose of Milan quote, uh, and a wonderful John F. Kennedy quote that really emphasizes um, what I hope to be the main takeaway. Uh, and with that, the 45 minutes that I promised are 16 minutes over, but I'm happy to stay and answer any questions people have. Dennis, thank you so much for um, your contribution to this conversation. It um, To be able to have... Um, different people come and speak and to be able to appreciate the multidisciplinary approach to acknowledge that it is really a matter of social, social economic and environmental justice to have from your discipline acknowledging the the the, the crossover the the relationships that's so much a part of of Pope Francis's encyclical yeah. and also I think it, it's it's um inspiring for me to be able to acknowledge that our faith tradition, accounts for what is best known by way of the sciences. And so you have the Vatican that brings in the best scientists to be able to um, inform how we not only um, uh, are true to our responsibility in um, love of God and neighbor, but also uh, amidst the, the greater uh, created world. Uh, we are short on time. I'm yeah. going to very quickly look at chat and see if I have anything. Yeah, um, I do have one from Steve. Uh, he must have asked this very at the very beginning. So sorry, Steve, but um, is sulfur dioxide from fossil fuels also a concern? The short answer is yes, but not from a climate change perspective. So we have so many environmental concerns. Uh, sulfur dioxide is regularly emitted by industrial activities. It's a bigger concern with regards to acid precipitation and smog. Uh, so those sorts of air quality concerns. Uh, sulfur dioxide, it's actually so thick that it will block out some of the sun getting there. So from a greenhouse gas perspective, it really doesn't behave in that way. Um, but from an environmental perspective, yes, absolutely a huge concern. So, For the sake of time, Dennis, I am gonna, I'm gonna uh, wish people well. This is absolutely going to be recorded. Um, again, I wanna say thank you to, to Dennis Teresi. I've never sat in Dennis's classroom before. But I can imagine what his lectures are like, having had him share with us and the passion that he has for it. Um, I would also add that when I see Dennis, it's by way of his sustainability committee or the, the university sustainability committee. And also to say that uh, we are blessed to have a university 
and religious sisters and a, uh, a Catholic high school as neighbors, because this type of, this type of um, response, we're doing things that we had never anticipated doing before. And, and we're beginning to realize it. And it is all um, based on the best available information that we have uh, in, in making sure that we uh, are staying true to our responsibilities uh, for Care for Creation. Again, thank you, Dennis, so much. Uh, we will stay in touch. And thank you all that attended. Um, and, and have a very good day and the rest of your Easter season. Thank you. Thanks. You too, Kent. I, I really appreciate all of the kind words. Um, I am happy to stay. You know, if you want to turn the recording off, that's totally fine. But I do have uh, 20 or 25 minutes. If people do have other questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer them. Otherwise, I will say, Kent, uh, I think you're selling yourself a little bit short there. Um, it has been fantastic working with you as a as a community connector and, and someone who really knows uh, a lot of different ways to get involved and make a difference. Um, it's It's been a wonderful collaboration on our end as well in that regard. So um, keep up your good work as well. Thank you.